welcome to a special edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, where we bring you the top pro-life news and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. In this special edition, a young woman shares her courageous decision to place her son for adoption. Hear how God worked in her life. Actor Kirk Cameron opens up about being pro-life in Hollywood. And this. Only Christ saves us. And until that relationship is rooted, until our kids see mom and dad pray together, then we're gonna continue having these conferences about sexual exploitation. Model turned Catholic speaker Leah Darrow shares how we can build up a culture of life starting at home. But before we get to all of that, we want to remind you of how you can be a part of the pro-life movement and take action anytime, including right now. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Simply open up your internet browser and type in ProLifeWeekly.com. When you go to this website each week, you'll see what the most urgent pro-life action is based on that week's pro-life needs. We'll tell you how to get involved and how to take action. Our call to action is a simple way to get involved in just a matter of clicks. So be sure to regularly check out ProLifeWeekly.com and see what the call to action is this week and every week. One of the groups of people most often targeted for abortion are unborn babies prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome. It's a tragedy we even see encouraged in our media. In March of 2018, the Washington Post ran an op-ed entitled, I would have aborted a fetus with Down syndrome. Women need that right. Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, who has a son with a genetic condition, responded to the article on Twitter prompting the Washington Post writer to double down on her argument. For a reaction and to discuss how babies with Down syndrome are targeted for abortion, we spoke with Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, who chairs the House GOP conference and co-chairs the Congressional Task Force on Down syndrome. Here's a look back at our interview. Congresswoman, what do you think of how Ruth Marcus of the Washington Post responded to your tweets? It was disturbing. Clearly, Ruth Marcus hasn't spent a, enough time with people who have Down syndrome. More than anything, I'd like to introduce her to our son, Cole, who's now 10 years old, and have her meet this young kid of mine. He brings us so much joy, and I've seen the positive impact that he has on our family and everyone that he meets. And the fact that he has Down syndrome only makes me more curious as to the impact that he's going to have on this world. You have been very open about the fact your son Cole has Down syndrome. Tell us about Cole. How have you seen your son exceed expectations? So I was, I was 35 and single when I was elected to Congress and so excited that I met Brian the August after I was elected and we got married the following year and then I became pregnant and what a blessing that was. And then to hear the news that Cole had Down syndrome that was tough news. He's our oldest. He's our firstborn. You have all kinds of hopes and dreams. And Down syndrome isn't on that list. Uh, and, and at the beginning, I remember the doctors sitting down and talking with us and, and walking us through a long list of complications and uh, other difficulties that we may face or that Cole would face because he had that extra 21st chromosome. From the very beginning, Brian and I looked at Cole and saw potential. And, and I have seen Cole exceed all expectations. And I've learned not to put limitations on him because he's defined the odds, I guess. <laughs> or, or maybe people just are not seeing what those with Down syndrome can really do. I've heard you say having a child with Down syndrome can be tough, but just because it's tough doesn't mean it's not positive. Can you tell us more about that? And what would you want women who are pregnant with babies with Down syndrome to know? Well, having, having a son with disabilities is not, is not what you dream of. And yet, today I can testify that I am so grateful for Cole's influence on me. Me as a mom, as a person, as a legislator. And, and when I say that something is tough, um, at times it's, it continues to be tough, but it doesn't mean that it's not positive, that he is 
having an amazingly positive impact on me and the people that he meets as well as this world. And that's what I want people to focus on. I am proud today to be a part of the disabilities community. And whenever I meet with someone who has a, a family member with Down syndrome or I meet someone with Down syndrome or someone within the disabilities community, I feel like we're family <laughs> because we have in common this understanding of just because something is tough uh, doesn't mean that it's not positive. We know firsthand how positive those with disabilities have on our, on our families and on our communities. Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, thank you for your time. Good to be with you. Again, we thank the Congresswoman for her time on that important discussion. For women facing an unplanned pregnancy, adoption is a beautiful option. For the child, for adoptive mothers, and as we share in this next story, for the birth mothers as well. Here's one young woman's courageous journey to place her son for adoption. I was in a sorority. I was very dedicated to getting straight A's. When Kelly Clemente talks about the early part of college, she describes herself as an all-American girl. Dating the man of my dreams, it just, it seemed like everything in my life was going so well. But at the age of 18, Clemente's life took a sudden and unexpected turn when she discovered she was pregnant. Being a parent, being a mom, um, I wasn't ready for that. I didn't have a stable job. Um, I knew that my parents weren't going to help me raise the child. Kelly fit the criteria for the kind of woman abortion clinics would target. But instead, this I young woman turned to a different, life-affirming decision. The night that I found out I was pregnant, I chose adoption. Adoption is becoming increasingly rare, and women who are having to make these decisions don't have examples or positive examples of women who have made this decision. Chuck Johnson is president and CEO of National Council for Adoptions. He says adoption numbers have declined over a 50-year history, but what women who choose it can lead a fulfilling life. And many women who've made the decision to place a child for adoption have decided that they are actually being a good parent because they have made a thoughtful and informed decision to make sure that their child is in a safe, loving home. While the decision to adopt was easy for Kelly, the journey leading to it was not. At eight months pregnant, the young mother discovered her dream boyfriend, the father of her child, had been cheating on her. I was really devastated. Uh, I felt like trash. Clemente no longer believed her life was worth living. I walked out to the road and I was in the middle of the street. I laid in the street, and I knew that it would take me probably five minutes to stand up because I was eight months pregnant, and I was just laying there, and I'm like, well, you know, I, I would be okay if a car ran me over. When suddenly, Kelly tells us, she heard a still, small voice. This new voice from within me, but not from me, said, get up, I'm not done with you yet. And it startled me, like, where did that come from? Um, I thought to myself, okay, I'll, um, I'll get up. Because this baby didn't do anything wrong. This baby doesn't deserve to get run over. This baby isn't trash, I'm trash. The voice spoke out one more time and it, the voice said, no, I said, I'm not done with you yet. That encounter, which Kelly believes was an encounter with God, changed her life and saved another's. Kelly gave birth to a healthy young boy, Alex, and placed him with a family she met through a Christian adoption agency. I'm nine years old. We love having a relationship with Kelly. She's part of our family and part of Alex's life. There's never really been a day that Alex hasn't known about Kelly. Nine years later, and Kelly, Alex, and his adoptive family all still have a close relationship today. So close, Alex and his adoptive mother, Sean, even flew from Texas to Washington, D.C. to support Kelly at a recent speaking event. I'm just going to speak from my heart because my, um, 
the story of my life. I love that I'm birth mommy. It's a beautiful part of my life. Kelly has discovered adoption does not mean giving up a child. Adoption requires courage and love. Just take it from this nine-year-old boy. It's fun to place your kid for adoption and like, um, there will be another, there will be other parents that will come and, you know, take care of them for you and you don't have to be scared for your child. Kelly is birth mom strong and so brave to share her story with us. Our next story also features a group of brave pro-lifers, those who are on the front lines outside of abortion clinics. We give you a close-up look at the group 40 Days for Life in action. Maria, Ave, Ave. Location is everything, which is why the sidewalk surrounding this rundown building is prime real estate for this group of pro-lifers. As people of faith, we have a strong faith community here in Maryland. We're called to point out evil and to share the charity, the love in our hearts. Tom Trunk is the campaign coordinator for 40 Days for Life in College Park, Maryland. The group has been faithfully praying here about a decade because this building is only uglier on the inside. Behind us is an abortion facility that's been in existence for 30 years. 40 days reinforces to the community the evil that abortion is. The community-based campaign 40 Days for Life is aimed at ending abortion through prayer and fasting, constant vigil, and outreach. With chapters in over 700 cities and nearly 50 countries, the Christian campaign sees results with nearly 15,000 unborn lives saved, some of them right here. Very friendly lady stopped and came down to us as we were praying the rosary, and she said, I never want to see you stop this. I want to thank you. She said, my name is Veronica. Don't you know that last spring when you were out here praying, I tried, I came, I had the doubt in my heart, and I was abortion-minded, but I couldn't because there were people praying here at the sidewalk. There are over 100 save stories at this clinic, including one time when the group handed a pregnant mother information on fetal development. They gave this woman going in this literature, and she was in there, and she, she started to read it, and she said, no, it's not true. My baby's heart isn't, hasn't been beating since day 19, and it, it really it, uh, pricked her conscience. The woman's credit card wound up not working at the abortion clinic, and she left. She, this girl, Joy, saw my white hair and comes walking to me crying, and it falls into my arms crying. Her baby's going to be a year, April 7th. And another time, there was a woman that was sitting over there in the gas station watching us for a long, 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 long time. And, and then finally she came over and she introduced herself and she said that, that she was watching us and not going to have uh, the abortions. We're the sunshine on the sidewalk. Everything we can offer them from parenting support and adoption is always going to be better than coming into this place here. 40 Days for Life doesn't keep vigil outside abortion clinics to scorn women. They are there to help them. And as first-hand witnesses of lives transformed, members here say it's important for pro-lifers to simply show up on the sidewalk. When we go to mass and frequent confession and we pray to end abortion, it's important to know that we can help by coming out to your local facility and offering four hours a month. Our presence here has demonstrated to these women that we care and that we love them and that we know we're knowledgeable about the solutions that are offered to pull them away from this clinic. It really is a matter of us just being out here and offering all the abundant options instead of coming into a place like this. There were three saves within two hours, three babies saves, saved that we knew of. And this one person afterwards, he just, I mean, he, he came up and, and he also wrote about it later. And he just said, I was so sad. And I was like, why are you sad? There were three saves that day, you know, which is not always, are there, you know, any known saves. 
Um, but he just said, because it was so easy. All it took was people being there praying. Don't feel pressured that there's any type of requirement to pray a script prayer. The prayer that's in your heart is the prayer that the Lord is wanting to hear us pray. To be sunshine on the sidewalk, it's important to show up because you never know who will be watching. You can find out more about how to get involved with 40 Days for Life by going to 40daysforlife.com. When we come back. When I hear pro-life, I think, boy, that, that, that really ought to encompass everything from the, from, the, from the womb to the tomb, right? From the cradle to the grave. Actor Kirk Cameron opens up about his strong pro-life views and what it's like to be pro-life in Hollywood. Stay tuned as our special edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to our special edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hedro. We often tell you about celebrities promoting abortion, but it's rare we get to hear from people in the entertainment industry actually speaking up for life. Our next guest is an exception. Kirk Cameron first came to fame in the 1980s for his starring role in the TV sitcom Growing Pains. Cameron converted to Christianity after being a self-described atheist. The Evangelical Christian now creates TV and film projects centered on faith and living out the gospel message. He's married with six kids, four of whom are adopted. Here's our exclusive interview with actor Kirk Cameron. You've been public that you have not always been pro-life. You've written it was a gradual process. Tell us about that process. I think as a father of six kids and four of my kids being adopted has certainly played into the growing love that I have for everything that has to do with the life of children. So uh, it turns out that my wife is an adopted child herself, so is her brother. And when we started our family, we decided that we wanted to adopt uh, a child. And so we adopted uh, our first son and then two little girls and then our second son and then had two natural born children. And I think about the fact that, that I have so much of a treasure in my family today and that none of them would exist if it weren't for people who loved life and encouraged uh, mothers with unexpected pregnancies to give birth to their children. My whole family was just one appointment away from not existing. And so as a husband and as a father, I've grown in my love for life and my appreciation for those who come up alongside moms and tell them, you can do this. That really puts it into perspective. Kirk, why do you think it is with all of the information that we have on abortion and the truth about life, why do you think there are still so many people who don't consider themselves pro-life? What's the disconnect there? I think that that really does say a lot. I think at the end of the day, we're all pro-life. Uh, it's just that it's, it's usually our life that we want to design to be the best that we perceive it could be. So uh, sometimes that, inc that includes a pregnancy and other times it might not include a pregnancy. But at the, at the end of the day, my value system says that all life is precious. And, and I think that at the end of the day, when I talk with people who have been, uh, uh, who have received an abortion, people who are considering abortions, people who have chosen to give their, their, their children life, I think at the end of the day, we all know that life is precious, that it's a gift from God. You mentioned your value system. Here we are, we're speaking on the Global Catholic Network. Kirk, you're not Catholic, but you are a practicing Christian, very public about that. Can you speak more about how your Christian faith informs the way you view life and the sanctity of life? Well, it, it, it affects it in a profound way because to be pro-life is to be pro-God. God is life. He's the source of life. He's the center of my life and my kids' lives. And so I think we should be doing everything that we can to protect it and to enhance it so that uh, we can help everyone come to a place of enjoying abundant life. You've transformed your career, Kirk, into now making 
films for the family. Can you speak about why that is important to you and the role the family in particular plays in the pro-life movement and into building a culture of life? So we hear the terms uh, uh, pro this, pro that, or anti this or anti that. And, and, and when I hear pro-life, I think, boy, that, that, that really ought to encompass everything from the, from, the, from the womb to the tomb, right? Mm -hmm. From the cradle to the grave. So uh, if I'm pro-life, that means I'm pro-baby. I'm also pro-mom. I'm pro-dad. I'm pro-lives. I'm pro-family. I'm pro-life because life is, is better than death. And so I've tried to focus my career and even my time off the screen on things that really promote life in the arenas of faith and family. You're speaking to us from Calabasas, California. How are you treated by others mm -hmm. in the film industry for your pro-life views and pro-family views? Are you respected? I, you know, I, I don't. I don't. I, I try not to pay uh, uh, too much in too much attention to uh, whether or not people like me. My view is, I have a couple of people that I deeply respect. My wife is one of them. I have a couple of really close friends, and then of course, God. And if I can live my life in a way that is really for an audience of one person and look for the applause of heaven, and have the respect of my wife and a couple of people that I know are full of wisdom, and want the best for me and for my family, then I'm going to take my cues there. Kurt Cameron, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Nice to talk with you. Have a great day. From movie screens to the pages of magazines, our final interview is with a former top model who today uses her platform to affirm the beauty of life. Leah Darrow is a former model turned Catholic speaker and author of the new book, The Other Side of Beauty. Darrow is also a wife and mother to four kids. At the time of our interview, you'll notice she was eight months pregnant with her youngest. In our interview, Darrow shares how she thinks we can build up the culture of life starting at home. Leah, you are a mother to two young girls, possibly three. We'll find, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out soon. <laughs> what practical advice do you have for other parents so that when they are raising their young daughters, they can grow up to be modest and chaste, especially as we're discussing, we're in this disordered kind of warped view of what that means today. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm a new parent. I've only been a parent for five years. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I would never venture to say that I know it all. Mm -hmm. But at one, there are a few things that I do know. Mm -hmm. One, define your terms. Mm -hmm. Parents, define your terms. Define the word beauty for your girls, for your boys. Define love. Define God. Define happiness. Because we go after things that make us happy. And within that happiness term are those other terms of love and beauty. Mother Teresa was one of the most photographed women in the world at the time that she was alive. Hmm. I mean, this is a woman who was barely five feet tall, wrinkles all over her face, hmm. hunched over because she took care of so many hmm. people, deformed feet because she refused to wear the right shoes. She always gave them away. Hmm. And yet every time someone met her, the one thing that everybody said is that she was beautiful. So as parents, what we can do is that we can define beauty for our kids. Mm. We can let them know that it's, yes, it's wonderful that you can look cute in an outfit, but we're so much more than that. Wow. Do you have specifically advice for parents of young boys so that they can truly respect women as they continue to grow in life? Well, for one thing, parents need to just model these behaviors themselves. Mm. You know, dads need to be strong. They need to be talking. They need to see, you know, kids will model the behaviors of their parents. So we need to take a look in. You know, I, I keep going back to Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. and there's a story that I love about her. Uh, there was a group of, when she came to the United States, mm -hmm. there's a group of young women who came to meet her, and they were listening to her give a small talk. Mm -hmm. And one woman stood up and said, I want to come with you. I want to go to Calcutta. I feel called to help. Wow. I feel called to do this. And she looked at her and she just said, no. And of course the woman was taken aback. Right. It's Mother Teresa talking to you. And she just says to her, no, um, go find your own Calcutta. When Mother Teresa told that young woman that, I think that that's the same message that she and Christ tells all of us. 
Go home and love the poor. Go home mm. and love your family. Mm. And it's really important as adults and as parents that we realize that it starts with us as the parent, me individually as mother, mm. that I'm the poor, mm. that there's poor in me, that there are, there's brokenness within me that needs healing from Christ, that I need to look there mm. so that I can be the example for my kids ah. to let them know that beauty, that hope, that mercy are alive and well. Mm. That beauty, hope, and mercy have a name and have a face, and that's Christ Jesus. And I think when our kids can see that in our home, mm. I think that that's when things change. I think that it's not always all these practical tools and Bible studies and conferences, although they're wonderful and they're great, mm -hmm. but those won't save us. Mm. Only Christ saves us. And until that relationship is rooted, until our kids see mom and dad pray together, then we're going to continue having these conferences about sexual exploitation. Then we're going to continue talking about mm. the prophetic nature of humani vitae and I don't know what to do. Mm. What we need to do is we need to go home and we need to pray and to love our families. You know, Leah, on EWTM Pro Life Weekly, we often are addressing abortion, but mm -hmm. abortion contraception, cohabitation, they're all connected to the body. Absolutely. There's a huge connection, and, and I think anybody of faith knows that. Mm -hmm. They know the connection of when we, when we don't define love in light of Christ, then things start to break down. Mm -hmm. We allow ourselves to be used for the sake of love. Cohabitation, you know, sex outside of marriage, abortion, contraception, all of these things have been brought into our world in some effort to liberate us. But we've never asked from what? And we never mm -hmm. have asked, who is the one saying this? Mm -hmm. And there is a voice in this world that wants to liberate us in a sense from truth, from God. Mm -hmm. And that voice does not come from God. We know where that voice comes from. That voice is from Satan. That voice is evil. I want to continue on with that. I mean, we're on the Global Catholic Network. You're a Catholic. Why do you think the devil, Satan, hates the body and attacks the body so much? I think because we, we let him. Hmm. Because we've allowed it. We've made our bodies, in particular, idols. They're golden calves everywhere. We worship them. I mean, how often do we really think about our spiritual life? Mm. How often do we think about our soul? You know, I, mm. I mean, so often, you know, we could get on the scale and see the progress that we've made. What if we got on the scale and it told us the progress of our soul? Leah Darrow, thank you for your insight and for your witness and for speaking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for our special edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. Thank you for watching. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at our email address, prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. I look forward to seeing you here again next week. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.